Example 1. Analyze the graph of r of x equals x over the quantity x minus 1 times x plus 2. So step 1, we want to identify the domain of this rational function. So we're looking for zeros of the denominator to exclude from the domain because we know that the denominator of a fraction or a rational function can never equal zero. So we can see this is nicely factored for us. We, so we can see that the zeros of the denominator will be 1 and negative 2. So our domain will be the set of x's such that x does not equal negative 2 or 1. Step two, we want to identify if we have any holes in the graph of this function. Remember, holes occur when there's a factor that's common in the numerator and denominator of the function. So there's no factors common to the numerator and the denominator, so we have no common factors. So no common factors in numerator and denominator, so no holes. Step three, we want to identify the intercepts. So first we want the x-intercepts. Well, we know to find x-intercepts of any function, we set the function equal to zero. So we put in a zero for our y value or our r value in this case. Well, if we put a zero in for our r and we solve, when you set a rational function, equal to zero. The only way that a fraction can be equal to zero is if its numerator is equal to zero. Because the denominator of a fraction we know can never equal zero. So in order for this equation to be true, the numerator has to be zero. So a shortcut for the x-intercepts, we just look right at the function when it's factored and, and identify any zeros of the numerator. So our numerator is x, so we obviously know our, our x-intercept here is going to be zero. So our x-intercept is 0. And then to find our y-intercept, we know we're just going to plug in a 0 for our x value. But we already know if our x-intercept is 0, our y-value is also 0. But if you just want to note it in your notes, just in case it was a different problem. So we evaluate the function when x is 0. We get 0 over 0 minus 1 times 0 plus 2, which is obviously going to give us 0 because we knew our x intercept was 0. So obviously our y-intercept is also 0. Okay, step 4. We want to find our vertical asymptote or vertical asymptotes. So if we look at our function, once our function's in lowest terms, and this function's already in lowest terms, we didn't have any common factors to reduce. So we just look at zeros of our denominator. So those excluded values that we excluded from the domain, those are location of the vertical asymptotes. So we know we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1 and x equals negative 2. Now our horizontal or oblique asymptotes. So remember a function could have one or the other or neither. And we determine which one they have, if any, by comparing the degree of the denominator and the degree of the numerator. So in this function, our denominator is degree 2. Our numerator is degree 1. So this is a proper rational function where the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator. So there's no work to show. We just automatically know there's a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, no work to show. All we had to do was compare. And we saw that the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator. So that's a proper rational function. And for all of those functions, no work to show. You just know that it's y equals 0. Now we want to check if our graph crosses this horizontal asymptote. Remember, graphs can't cross vertical asymptotes because those are undefined values of the function. But a graph may cross a horizontal or oblique asymptote. So to, de to determine if our graph crosses it, we're just going to set our function equal to the horizontal asymptote. So our horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. So if we put in a 0 for our y into our function, we end up solving the equation that we actually just solved above. And you can see then that our x value here is 0. So it turns out that this graph will cross 
the horizontal asymptote when x is 0. And we already saw that above when we found the intercept. So we can say, yes, it will intersect at x equals 0. Now, when we go to graph it, we can use our graphing calculator to help us get an idea of the shape and check some of our work that we did here. So here's our function entered in our y equals editor. Now, notice I put our numerator was just one term. We didn't need any grouping symbol around it. But in our denominator, we have those two parentheses, x minus 1 and x plus 2. They must all be enclosed in a set of parentheses because you're not just dividing by the first x minus 1. You're dividing that x by the product of x minus 1 and x plus 2. So don't forget to put the parentheses around the entire denominator. So now I'll graph in a standard viewing window. Zoom standard. And there we can see that rough idea of the shape of our graph. So we can see some those vertical splits in the graph. So you can see here the graph starts to look vertical here and here, as well as here and here. That's because those are the location of the vertical asymptotes. So here at x equals negative 2, and that certainly looks like x equals 1, we've got those vertical splits in the graph. You can also see a horizontal split in the graph here at the x on the x-axis, which is y equals 0, which that makes sense because we just found that our horizontal asymptote was y equals 0. We can see our intercept here at the origin, and we can see that that graph is intersecting that horizontal asymptote. So all of our work looks good. Okay, so when we go to sketch the graph, we'll use all that information from above and then that picture that we have in the calculator. Okay, so I like to sketch the asymptotes first because that kind of gives you a nice, some nice boundary lines on your graph. So I'll just sketch a few units each direction here. Okay, so we've got our vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 2 and x equals 1. And we've got our horizontal asymptote on the x-axis, y equals 0. So now we can see when there's multiple vertical asymptotes, our grid is going to have more than just four blocks. A lot of the, the parent functions that we did had four quadrants, if you will, to the grid formed by the asymptote. So here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six regions to our grid here. So you want to think that your, the shape of your graph is going to fit roughly in this grid. So we know we have our intercept, our y and x intercept at the origin, and that's where the graph is crossing that horizontal asymptote. Now we know in each grid vertically, I'm either going to have a piece of my graph here or here. I know I can't have a piece above and below because otherwise it wouldn't be a function. It would fail the vertical line test. So I'm either going to have a branch up here or down here. And we can look on the calculator and see it's going to be below the x-axis. Another way to do it would be to evaluate the function for an x value over here. So the vertical asymptote is negative 2. So if I picked a number like negative 3, for instance, I could even go onto my table of my calculator and I go to where x is negative 3, you're going to get a negative y value of negative 0.75, negative 3 fourths. So that gives us a little more accuracy here. 1, 2, 3, negative 3, negative 3 fourths. So you can see you're going to have this branch. And when you sketch the branch, it has to approach the vertical asymptote and approach the horizontal asymptote. Get closer and closer, but never cross. Now, in the middle, in the middle we know that this function is going to cross the horizontal asymptote here. So we are actually going to have one piece, and you can look at the graph, and we can see it's kind of that snake-looking shape in the middle. That's one of the common shapes you'll see. Another one is you'll see the branches on the right and left, and in the middle you'll have like a parabola shape. Those are some common shapes for these rational functions. So we can just approximate that snake shape. And again, what's important is that you're graphing this correctly where it's approaching 
that vertical asymptote and approaching this one. If you did something like that, that would be incorrect because that's clearly not approaching the vertical asymptote. Okay, so then our final piece of the grid, so we've got the top and the bottom right. Again, we're going to have a branch either in the top or the bottom, and we saw in the calculator it's going to be in the top. And once again, we can get a point up here to make this a little bit more accurate. So this is when x is 1. We could pick an x value such as 2. So if we go to the table where x is 2, you're going to see a y value of 0.5. So that gives us a nice point here, 2 and then 0.5 or 1 half, just to make us a little more accurate. And then we can sketch our boomerang shape, our branch shapes approaching, fitting in that block, fitting in that grid. So when you guys graph these, you'll need to label the intercepts, the asymptotes, and have the general shape correct. Now once we have our graph, we can talk about the end behavior. How does this graph behave for really large x's and really small x's? So let's first go for the large x's. So as we trace along the rightmost piece, we've got three pieces. The rightmost piece, as we trace along to the right, as x gets larger and larger, that y value is flattening out here. It's approaching 0. So we can say, as x approaches infinity, it's not f of x here, it's r of x. As x approaches infinity, r of x approaches 0. Then on the other end, so my left branch, as I trace along my left branch, as x gets smaller and smaller, again, it's flattening out, starts to look horizontal, it's approaching y equals 0. So we can say as x approaches negative infinity, r of x also approaches 0. Now we can describe the behavior around the vertical asymptotes. So we've got two vertical asymptotes. So let's first look at the negative 2. I've got a branch on the left and the right. So let's look at the left branch. As I trace along this branch approaching that vertical asymptote, my y values are decreasing infinitely. So I can say as x approaches negative 2 from the left side, we use that superscript negative to indicate the left side, r of x approaches negative infinity. Then we look at the branch on the right side of this vertical asymptote. As we trace along this branch and get closer and closer to negative 2, now our y values are increasing infinitely. So we can say as x approaches negative 2 from the positive side, the right side, r of x approaches positive infinity. And then we can describe the behavior around x equals 1. So we, as, as we approach from the left, as we trace along this branch, those y values are getting smaller and smaller. So we can say as x approaches 1 from the left, r of x approaches negative infinity. And then finally, as x approaches negative 1 from the right, from the positive side, so on this side of x equals 1, oh yeah, sorry, this should be a, a 1 down here, not a negative 1. So as this branch approaches x equal to 1, the y values get infinitely larger, so r of x approaches positive infinity.